All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And I am calling to order this Joint Arts Commission and Public Art Committee meeting to order on Monday, August 17th, and it is currently 3.01 p.m. So we'll start with the roll call of the Arts Commission, followed by a roll call of the Public Art Committee. Okay, roll call of the commission. Commissioner Zadikian. Yeah. Commissioner Yaya. Commissioner Swimmer. Here. Commissioner Sebermanian. Here. Commissioner Michaels. Here. Commissioner Jackson. Here. Commissioner Chalice. Commissioner Brock. Here. Commissioner Baroff. Here. Vice Chair Masucci. Here. And Chair Myers. Here. Now I'll call the roll for the uh, Public Art Committee. Committee Member Doherty. Here. I, I, believe, here. I believe she's here. Uh, committee Member Subramanian. Yes, here. Committee Member Vaughn. Here. Committee Member Baroff. Here. Committee Member Barr. Here. Committee Member Pugh. Here. Ah, good. Uh, committee Member Gittleman. Here. And Committee Member Yahia. Uh, chair. Not present. Um, okay, thank you very much. And uh, is there any public comment that's been submitted? We received no public comment. Thank you very much. So with that, we are on to the chairperson's report. And today, in all likelihood, will be my final time delivering a chairperson's report to you all after nine years. Council will be making appointments in September. Um, and if we don't have a meeting before then, this is it. So I hope you guys will forgive me uh, if I go on for a little bit longer than you were anticipating. But there are a few things that I want to leave you all with. And that is that 12 years ago when I got appointed to this mission, it was with the idea that we could really do some amazing things in Santa Monica to make it a better place to not only experience art, be an artist, be an arts organization, but also be a, an audience member. And I think that we had a lot of successes. And I think those successes were predicated on this commission, uh, pushing staff and pushing council into not accepting anything less than what is required to be a city that is known for its art. Um, on March 11th, right before everything closed down, myself and some of the other commissioners here had a meeting with the city manager because it seemed as though uh, given what had gone down with the Sheets mural, that the Arts Commission wasn't being listened to that much anymore. And I know in the nine years I've been chair, I've really tried to fight this idea that what we do is a, a rubber stamp because I think that we have a tremendous value to this city. And I'm really sad because I feel like I've weekend and some other people trying to make art in the city and nobody knows who to talk to. Nobody knows what the plan is to come back. Whole sectors of our economy are unsure of how they're going to make art again. And I feel like this is a time that this city needs an arts commission to be advocating for policies, to be advocating for helping some of the longstanding artists and, and businesses that have been here. But not to say that we don't have our challenges because we all know that the staff restructuring was massive but i really really hope that you all find a way to fight to get your commission back because we need to be out there advocating for artists and i don't think we can do it in a manner where the last two meetings feels like we're sort of a project review panel um and i don't want to be negative but it's just very disappointing to me because i feel like in this time when our elected leaders need to be hearing uh about the amazing struggles that are going on i mean i've had i've been at santa monica businesses who have told me that they don't know even who to pay in the city 
that have, so there's a lot of confusion in the city. And with that confusion, as long as there still is a Santa Monica Arts Commission, I really hope that you guys push it. Bergamont is a project that you guys all know that I was very involved in. And there was an ad hoc committee and we were trying to make a board happen. And unfortunately that work didn't get done. And I hope you guys continue on with that work because with the shortfalls that the Big Blue Bus is experiencing and the fact that any place of public assembly, which is what Bergamont Art Center is, is absolutely devastated. And those people are looking at tens and tens of thousands of dollars in debt, you know, that they may never be able to recover. And if there isn't an arts commission that's asking questions and trying to find solutions, they're not going to have a chance. Um, the only thing that makes me feel good is that I know that there are so many passionate. You guys are all so passionate. I've learned so much from you guys. Really, I've learned so much from you guys over the last few years, and I know how passionate you all are. And I know you guys can do it. And just be willing to take some no's. That's, that's what I leave you with. I implore you to be willing to take some no's because, you know, a piece of art's only any good if it's risen out of necessity. And we're going to get pushed back. We're going to get pushed down, but it doesn't mean it's not worth it. So uh, thank you guys for uh, the opportunity. And uh, without further ado, we shall move on to new business discussion and possible action on a presentation by a private developer on a new art for 500 Broadway, Santa Monica, California, 90401. Presentation is before us. Great. Hey, thank you, Mike. Um, so do the Whitcoff people want to unmute their videos? Hi, everyone. Can you see me and hear me? Yeah. Great. Yes. Um, shall I begin sharing my screen? I'm Isabella from Gagosian Gallery. I'm an art dealer who was involved since the beginning with the developer in deciding which artist was the right artist to commission a specific artwork for this project. So I will start sharing my screen. Okay, does everyone see everything okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm an art dealer at Gagosian Gallery in New York City, and I worked with my client, who's the developer of 500 Broadway, from the very beginning stages in selecting the right artist for a site-specific public artwork for their site. So I'll dive right in with just a bit of background on the artist that we selected to create the artwork. Her name is Sarah Z. She is a 51-year-old American artist born in Boston and currently lives and works in New York. She's a multidisciplinary artist working in multimedia from sculpture to painting to video installation. And Sarah Z has been even credited with changing the very potential of sculpture working from an exhaustible supply of materials, ranging from everyday materials to natural materials, et cetera. She's very well respected in the art world. Not only is her work included in many well-renowned private collections globally, but also in many major uh, US museums. And to name just a few notable US museum collections, which include works by Sarah Z, we have uh, MoMA in New York, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, SF MoMA in San Francisco, MoCA in LA, the Cartier Foundation in Paris, the Guggenheim in New York, and the Whitney in New York. So in 2013, Sarah Z received one of the highest honors as a contemporary artist when she was selected as the sole artist to represent the United States of the Venice Biennale and her work was a solo presentation in the American Pavilion, and this isn't always the case. There are sometimes multiple artists that, the, that will be chosen for a country, but she was the only artist showing that time. So additionally, here uh, she's been 
Selected for numerous public sculpture commissions in highly prestigious spaces, some of which you can see in the images here. To name just a few, uh, an upcoming project is at Storm King Art Center, which is the uh, very prestigious outdoor museum with large scale sculpture and site specific commissioned works in upstate New York. In 2018, they announced that they we're commissioning Sarah Z's site-specific work, Fallen Sky, which is scheduled to be installed in 2020, or it was, I don't know about now. <laughs> and this is an especially high honor because this is the first site-specific commission added to Storm King's collection in nearly a decade. Another recent project was uh, the Public Art Fund selected Sarah Z as one of four internationally recognized artists to create a site-specific works for the new LaGuardia Airport Terminal B that was just unveiled in, to the public recently in June. A couple of other examples are in 2016 and 17, the NTA New York commissioned a work by Sarah Z for the new 96th Street Station. And in 2011, 2012, the High Line commissioned a temporary public work by Sarah Z. So here I'll hand it over to Adam Gottlieb, who's the project manager at Witkov for 500 Broadway to give an overview of the development. Thanks, Isabella. Hi, everyone. Um, so really briefly about uh, setting a location for 500 Broadway, the initial concept for the project by Koning Eisenberg, our, our wonderful design architects who unfortunately couldn't be on to do this portion of the presentation. So I'm going to do my best to, to, to say their piece. Um, the building's matching, different from what you've typically seen in Santa Monica, where you'll have a, a, a circle building with an interior courtyard. The building's massings and open cross-directional uh, circulation actually open up views for the neighboring buildings beyond while facilitating breezes and enhancing social connection from the housing units above on the top uh, seven floors of the property to the street life below. The property is going to be a lead platinum mixed use development with 249 apartments over approximately 50,000 square feet of retail and commercial uses on the ground floor. As this, the series of public open spaces and widened sidewalks, as you can see uh, on the along Fifth Street, uh, they continue to connect into a linear park. It consists of outdoor seating, bike parking, and encourages public use of the streetscape and will also include our art piece. The public spaces are also covered by the projecting overhangs of the buildings above. There are covered areas on the corner of Fifth and Broadway and in between each of these areas down, down Fifth Street as you, go, uh, as you go further south. The white faceted ceilings underneath those overhangs are uplit at night reflecting a warm glow onto the pedestrian areas. The design also explores what a soft edge the building can provide rather than an abrupt edge which can contribute to the sense of neighborhood and neighborliness throughout the property. And Isabella, I'm kind of setting the scene. I'll pass it back to you to talk about the piece specifically. Okay, so I will jump back in now and speak about the proposed work by Sarah Z, and the work is entitled Split Stone. So Sarah Z's dramatic site responsive artwork will be a monumental centerpiece, marking and activating the ground level of the Fifth and Broadway Plaza Courtyard. The work will be site-specific, intimately related to its location, creating a dialogue with the surrounding architecture and landscaping. It will ex explore the fragility of time, weight, images, fragmentation, and atmosphere. Acting as a dynamic gateway to the public courtyard and the building, the piece will create a choreography of anticipation and surprise as well as allowing for intimate moments for pause and contemplation. So the sculpture will start with a natural boulder and split it into two halves like a geode. The cut will reveal a pixelated image of the Santa Monica coast embedded within the stone's interior. The static image of this fleeting moment will be fixed as though set in place through the forces of gravity and pressure. So the boulder will be around nine feet tall, yet, as I mentioned, the sculpture starts with a natural boulder. So the exact shape and precise height of the boulder will be determined when the natural boulder is selected, but it will be around this height. So here we're showing different shaped boulders to give an idea, since it's a natural boulder, some have you know, different, more jagged edges in the renderings, smoother. 
So it really depends on the natural boulder that's selected at the quarry. So the same image will be mirrored in the pavers of the walkway, as if the stone has printed itself onto the ground, creating a reflection of itself. This again connects to the landscape and culture of Santa Monica with the idea of looking at the reflection of an object in the water. Viewers will have an engaged experience with the work in the courtyard, walking directly through and over, and with the reflection of the images beneath their feet. So by recording images in pixels and then fixing them in stone and pigment, Sarah Z explores the fragility of time passing and our desire for weight and permanence in the face of both overwhelming natural forces and the ubiquitous images that surround us daily. So the actual image that is embedded in the stone will be site specific, photographed by the artist Sarah Z at the nearby Santa Monica Beach. Embedded in the ground in the faces of the stone, it will trigger memory and awareness of the landscape just blocks away, serving as a constant reminder of the endless rise, fall, and rise again of the sun. So all of the images you see in this proposal, such as these two, are concept images and the images you see here um, of the beach and seaside at sun up or sun down. But, you know, the final image will be confirmed once the artist visits the nearby Santa Monica Beach, takes photographs at various times of day to see what image would work best for this specific piece. Okay, so the stones will anchor the landscape. Uh, they, will, they will function almost as a, a monument, anchoring and identifying the plaza, while the image within the stone concurrently refers back to the nearby landscape. You've seen this image, but I thought it went well with this description. Like a mirage within the cityscape, the imagery of sky and sea will appear to shift in color and density as the viewer moves through the space and sees the artwork in the round, tipping back and forth between an atmospheric color field and a photorealistic image. So here is another rendering. So the project explores the idea of landscape and image in many forms. Images of landscapes, landscapes as images, sculptures as landscapes in themselves. And we thought this worked really well with, you know, the setting. It's very tied into the culture of Santa Monica, of California, and being very tied into the natural world. The project plays with landscape and sculpture, as well as painting, printmaking, and the production of images, which is central to Sarah Z's practice as she fluidly flows between different mediums of art and art making. It references both the speed and ubiquity of contemporary image capture and ancient forms of mark making, bringing the painstaking project process of stone engraving and the sense of physical, physical gravity, weight, and authorship into our contemporary context, where anonymous and fleeting digital images have become a kind of debris that constantly swirls around us. So here we have a bird's eye view of the planned placement of the sculpture in the plaza. So you can see from this how many different ways the public can interact with the work not only viewing it from the front view, but walking on top of the mirrored images in the pavement, around the split boulder, essentially making the piece interesting from all angles and providing different ways to experience the artwork for the public. It's actually really hard to get a, a, a feel for that because the slide is so small. And I don't really know why these slides weren't in our packet because I don't have, I can't get a sense of it at all. Looking you can't at, see this? How I about can, this help? It doesn't really help. It, it, we, we, you have to understand that this app is, it's making it almost like a thumbnail. It's like that big. That's how much I get to look at. I can't expand it. So it's really hard to get a feeling for what these slides are. They, they really should have been in the packet. But I mean, I, your, your, your version is a lot smaller than everyone else's. It is. Okay. Yeah, because you're on as a moderator. Everyone else is seeing it more. So are you okay. seeing it okay? I have a question. 
Sure. It, I also want to echo Chair Myers in that uh, I there are two questions I have about this. One, how would we be expected to vote on the concept unless you're coming back and having this vote on the final design later, A, and B, as far as I understand, we're not allowed to vote on anything that we don't see and the public doesn't have a chance to see 72 hours, working hours in advance. So I have two questions there. One, we got a lot of writing in our packet, which is great, descriptive text, but mm -hmm. we didn't get any pictures in our text. And I think that's an issue, and it's also an issue for the public, because some members of the public might have decided, oh, we want to look at this and make comments either pro or con. That's not in the packet. I'm not sure if we're legally allowed to vote. And secondly, in addition to that, if the, if the image hasn't been selected yet, then we shouldn't be voting on anything until we are able to review the image in the entire context of the sculpture, which I think the concept is great, but I'm sort of confused. And I don't know if, if A, we're allowed to vote on anything that's on the packet. We didn't have drawings, images, anything. None of the slides you're showing me were included. And second of all, um, you're saying there is no image selected yet that the sculptor is going to go out and take some pictures. Well, we would want the chance to review the pictures before we voted on this. So I move that we table the discussion. Question? Is that Michael Baroff? Yes, it is. Okay, Commissioner Baroff? Well, help me understand really what our role in here. My understanding, this is a percent for the art that the developer and the curator have selected, and they're funding it. And that, in, I recall in prior experiences, looking at this kind of thing vis-a-vis, -vis, say, the David Lynch sculpture, which would be on Colorado, my understanding was our role was basically to bet the integrity of the proposal, the artist, and to affirm, basically, that the developer and the curator and the artists have the reputation and and to proceed. I don't understand that's why one, we're that's one part of it. Yeah. Sure. But that, so that's what my experience. On right, the last but I mean, I'm just quoting. I'm just quoting the policy, and the policy is that we're all supposed to be able to look at the proposed location and the accessibility of the work. I'm looking at a slide. I mean, I'm not telling you guys what to do. I'm saying I can barely see this slide. So based oh. off the fact that I just got it, I can't really determine determine maybe I would if I had printed it out as an eight and a half by 11 if I'd had it but I don't know how to determine whether the location is appropriate or it's appropriately accessible because I'm having a hard time looking at this rendering but that's just my opinion but that's certainly within our purview because we are supposed to look at not only the budget which we got right before the meeting and we're supposed to look at the you're right the qualification of the artist is first and foremost and then it's the aesthetic quality and harmony of the work within the development, and then we're supposed to look at proposed location and accessibility. So those are all the criteria of what we're supposed to do, if that answers your question, Commissioner Baroff. Uh, I think so, but I guess I'm also, I'll, I'm going to go back to what you said, Mike, you know, early on, that our role here in my experience was basically to, unless there was something outrageously offensive or horrible, we're basically affirming the decisions of the, of the, of the, the builders, the curators, the artists, and that our role isn't really to nitpick, <laughs> maybe that's not the right word, but to to challenge anything beyond what seems to be the integrity of their process and and the like. So that's my experience, and I'm not sure, so this conversation. Well, again, little, again I'm, just, I'm just quoting what the percent for our ordinance and right. what we've always done, which is, Determining the public access and the location and how the piece fits into the project is certainly within this commission's purview. Right. You clearly aren't having the same problem looking at the rendering that I am. So, like I said, it may not be applicable, but I'm bringing it up because on top of qualifications of the artist, the other things we're supposed to look at, which is in your packet, is aesthetic quality and harmony of the work within the proposed development, the location and accessibility of the work, the budget of the artwork to ensure that it 
only eligible expenditures are proposed and that they meet the 2% requirement. And then it goes through there. So those are the things we're supposed to look at on top of the artist selection. So I think that my, my question and Commissioner Brock's questions seem relevant. Whether or not everybody agrees with them is a different thing, but I wouldn't say they're irrelevant. Well, I will say that it's, this is Shannon, that it's um, not unusual at all for us to hold images so that the artist can do a reveal of their presentation. That's quite common. Um, in the Zoom world, it's, you're right, it's not the best <laughs> um, because you can't, can't see it as well. And Mike, you're at the further disadvantage of not being able to see it even more than others. And we can provide a PDF version of this so that you can send it and be able to actually see the images more clearly. Um, since, you know, in the Zoom world, it is difficult. <laughs> and sometimes things, the resolution's not as great and you, things come out small. So I'm happy to provide uh, Shannon and Naomi with a PDF that she can send along. The question for me is, should that have been included in our packet so that any yeah. members of the public would also be able to understand it as well? Now, as it turns out, we don't have any members of the public online right now, but I would have hoped that members of the public would attend. And I think that we are, that the administration is supposed to be mandated to provide full details. So. Look at I I I think the 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 boulders the rock and photograph idea is really cool. I also can't figure out. So is this close to this? it's right at the street, at the sidewalk level, according to the drawing you have up now. But then yes. when I looked at one of the other the your blueprint drawing, it looked like it was toward the rear. That one, is that where is that looks like it's. So the cars are directly in front. Got it. It's right here. Okay, under the yep. tree. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I didn't notice. I, I was looking at the green spot in the back and thought that. <laughs> it's okay. It's confusing to see it from all these okay. renderings. I, so I, understand. I understand that part. I still don't believe that we're supposed to be voting on something that, A, we can't see. We can see the placement. And if we're only supposed to be voting, as, as Commissioner Baroff says, on the um, concept, that's one thing. But otherwise, my belief is that everything should be transparent, and this doesn't feel really transparent. And it's too late to send a PDF to the chair because it was supposed to be done last Thursday. Um, may I say something? Sure. That's Lori, I guess. This is Lori Yeah. Hi. Okay. And, um, you know, the, the boundaries of the Arts Commission's participation in these projects is sometimes unclear. And I think we're also in a very strange time with the, with the pandemic and not being able to meet. And I think, uh, although this is less than ideal, we can see enough to get a sense of the placement. I think if we have questions about the materials, the the um, way that it'll be uh, um, able to to um, deal with the environment and those kinds of questions and what, what the plan is in terms of, um, I mean, I do have questions about those kinds of things, but I, I, I think there's enough here for us to be able to ask questions if we can't get the answers to the questions that we really need. Um, then that's a different issue, but I don't think we should just, you know, refuse to consider it because things aren't perfect in the right. Prison. And my question yeah. is, if this went to the city attorney's office, would the city attorney rule that enough information was given? And, and that's my problem okay. from a public transparency standpoint. And then, I, second, I, I, all, I'd love to have them come back then and show us the potential image that the photographer has chosen, since the images on the concept dry none of them are from Santa Monica yeah, and, that's, and that's been done many times before as you know Phil and other, yeah, I'm, other not, I'm not disagreeing with that Lori yeah if that was Lori I'm not disagreeing it was it was, it was. Okay. I do have some questions though about the materials and 
you know, the, how it's getting etched into the stone and how it's being put on the ground and what the plan is for, you know, um, preservation. Yes, that's um, in the following part of the presentation. Oh. I completely understand all these points and I'm sorry if maybe it was misleading. There's the image that's going to be embedded into the stone is going to be an image of the seaside at sunset or sunrise. There's not going to be any other image embedded in the stone. This is a concept, a series that she's thought about and she always does kind of a sunset or sunrise. She just wanted to make it site specific and actually go to the site itself to take an image that she, you know, to connect it back with the landscape that that's she lovely. just wanted to tie it in with the place. There's no other image that's going to be, I understand if maybe you would want to see the final image, the final rendering once she's photographed it, but it's, you know, the, I don't want to be confusing in that there might be a different image chosen of a completely different landscape. That makes sense. And I, I think that, you know, that we, uh, we can understand what the artist is doing and it makes sense to me anyway. Right. I, I she just wanted to tie it. Is it to yeah, Isabel, I don't think you got to the very end where you're actually showing the slides with the resin and the injection and just the methodology. No, I haven't. No, I did. That a lot of the questions that came up. So if, is it okay if I continue here? That'd be yeah. great. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so here's another bird's eye view of the placement. Here's another view from the street. So to apply the images to the stone and paving material, thousands of tiny cavities will be inscribed into the flat faces and filled with colored pigment, translating the techniques of lithography and dot matrix printing into detailed handiwork. So here you can really see more detail on how, how the pigment is inserted into the thousands of cavities on the flat surfaces to create the overall image. So every cavity and hole or hole is injected with UV resistant resin colored with light fast pigments. So the pigment is extremely durable and does not fade over time or with any sun with any amount of sun exposure. The artwork requires very little maintenance and is created with the intention of being outdoors within the elements in the sun and with the concrete pavers with the pigment injected into them, they're made with the intention of being walked on, et cetera. Uh, each hole is approximately four millimeter diameter. And once the pigment has been injected into the thousands of holes on the surfaces, the surface is ground flush, so it's all very smooth. So I hope this clarifies a bit. Can you go back to the image of it in the public space? I can't tell if it's like on the, is it on the, in the public right of way or is it actually on the property of, okay, so it's, it almost looks like it's on, just off the sidewalk. Like people will be walking, that's Broadway, right? Adam, is this Broadway? Is that Fifth Street or Broadway? Or is that Fifth Street? Yeah, that's Fifth Street. So it's on Fifth Street, not Broadway, correct? correct. Adam, can you confirm? Yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with the project. I know Hank's work on that. We did the hotel adjacent to it. Uh, so I know where that's going. So that's definitely on Fifth Street, uh, away from the corner of Broadway. So it's okay. it's sort of one section over. Right. So, but it's, the, but it's in the public right of way. So I'm I'm a little concerned. Also, I'm looking at the budget. I understand that it doesn't require maintenance, but is the insurance is that for does that cover vandalism? Does that cover if somebody tries to like chisel something into it? But I don't see any maintenance budget, so I'm wondering if there's a contingency budget for damage like that, which I could see happening given its location. 
Uh, Michael, I think this is uh, Commissioner Jackson. I think that's a great question because I was concerned about that too for vandalism. Um, and, and was wondering if the insurance is going to cover that too. Or is the insurance just like uh, the insurance? Or if a member of the public yeah, trips I, mean, insurance, uh, I, I don't have a specific answer on that at the moment. I mean, obviously, this is on the, the public pro or on private property, not on public property. So the building itself obviously has insurance, so it, it wouldn't be for, for, for tripping and falling. It would be for uh, for to protect the, the, the piece itself. Um, but certainly we can, can dig into and try and get a little more information there on, uh, on just what we think might be needed. Um, and, you know, reallocation, reallocating a portion of the budget for, uh, you know, maintenance specifically. Um, uh, and, and again, in the event someone was, was really trying to damage it. Um, you know, it, it could happen. The only other notes to add here, this this particular building, uh, it is a multifamily property that will is planned to have 24 hour um, security and door staff. So ideally, the likelihood of the vandalism is a little less than perhaps in other parts of town. But I, I understand. And and so but 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 I'm not wrong. And just because, again, if I took a screenshot, if anybody wants me to send it to them, I'm literally looking at these renderings in about three inches. I, I can see about three inches of them. Um, if the line between the public property and the private property is like within inches though, right? That part looks clear, right? Because that's a public sidewalk, right? People can, the public has access and an easement to walk down there all hours of the day, right? The building doesn't own Correct. the sidewalk. So literally, it's literally within inches, okay. Thank you. And, um, the studio would be very, I mean, we have, like Adam said, we haven't just, if, you know, gone through all the specifics, but in terms of if one of the pavers, if something happened or something got vandalized, I mean, the boulders are very sturdy, so something got, ch I'm, it's something we can discuss in terms of that, but I know that if the pavers or something happened to the pigment that was within one of the holes, which is very difficult to do because they're really, really secure in there, they would be, they would send someone over and fix it. So I have a question about the pavers. So what we're looking at is is a series of of slabs that that aren't they going to create lines so that sort of that reflection that's horizontal as opposed to vertical in the rock is it not just uh, cut up into a grid of pavers and what are these pavers exactly are they stone pavers are they concrete pavers what are they So um the studio is going to work with the construction uh, directly. They would want it to be flush, so it wouldn't be separate pavers just kind of inserted to make it look like a reflection. They would, you know, make the pavers specifically to be seamless and to implant into that spot. So during the construction, they would be working alongside them. So I, but I'm still a little unclear as to whether this will all be cut up with lines that demark the pavers so this will become a grid of pavers on which this image has been placed. Um, that's not the intention of the work. I know the artist has done similar kind of things to this before and they're well, well aware of the process. So even if it was separate separate pavers, they would make it look very seamless so that it didn't look like a grid because it would not look good, of course. That's not their intention for the work. So it'd be monolithic is what you're saying. Exactly. And even if, let's say, they were separate pavers, because they're grinding the surface flush, they could, you know, they're, they're trying to make it one continuous image. And do we know what those pavers are made of? I don't believe we know that yet. I understand that the artist studio is going to be in touch with the architects and the construction team to see what might work best. And Adam, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And is it the same? No, I, I think the, 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 the public, the public right of way there is is concrete. Um, but my, and again, this is something that hasn't been fully vetted for us. But really, we we thought we would be casting in. Uh, either a natural stone or a precast piece that had these water jetted holes into them 
So you'd have that one monolithic, monolithic piece laid in and probably poured to um, to have that seamless look or, or, or poured over, uh, or around. So can we just talk about conceptually about the, the project itself? Uh, coming from Europe, uh, you know, we have uh, things like Stonehenge and Avery Circle and number of places where stone has been used uh, to represent uh, many things. Uh, but this seems a bit light, just having two stones like that, somehow that sort of uh, connection to place through history uh, and, and, and sort of having something that has substance to it. This feels a bit light, just having a, this act as a, as a portal to, with just the two stones. Uh, it, it, I think it's a thin read as far as I'm concerned in, in terms of its substance and weight uh, through that. I mean, if you see again in this image, they're quite large. I mean, almost nine feet tall. And that, that doesn't impress me, I guess. <laughs> and what is the width? What's the width? Um, the width is about five to six feet. Of course, that's that's an approximation on the kind of stone that they're going to be looking for at the quarry. Am I? Can I say something? This is Deepa. Yes, Deepa. Okay. Now, uh, yeah. Thank you for. I, I think it's it's a, it's a very clever concept, and it looks uh, um, nice. From it looks really interesting from what we've seen so far. But uh, uh, the one thing that uh, instantly came to my mind was um, I, I remember Broadway as a, a really really narrow kind of a street uh, with a bike lane and. Uh, you know, um, it, it's it's the it's the narrowest loan, uh, road of all or streets of all the streets that I've seen in Santa Monica, and uh, so I'm really what what I'm really wondering about is the proportion of this artwork. It looks um, uh, you said it's it's about eight and a half feet in height and mm -hmm. uh, third in width, but it's it looks a bit overpowering for. Uh, a street of that caliber. I'm not so sure if um, uh, it's it's great, but if it was if it was set in a uh, in a in a large expanse of uh, land, uh, you perhaps you know it would it would get the uh, uh, you know the, the attention that it deserves. But I'm not so sure if you know in a street and in, this looks like it's not even on a sidewalk. It's inside the it's inside. I mean it's inside the uh, the, the 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 building uh, that's what it looks like so that's that's the thing that came to my mind and I don't think there'll be a case of vandalism because it's bolder and if at all anything um, in in that uh, re regard respect it could only be a, a natural um, you know weathering caused by natural causes is uh, what one should be worried about so. Uh, I don't know. I've seen, I've seen some boulders at the Grand Canyon that have been vandalized, so I wouldn't put it. I wouldn't necessarily go there. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, it's a proportion that I'm, um, you know, I'm thinking of. So if you could, uh, you know, show a few more slides that, you know, show different angles of this, uh, uh, the placement. So, perhaps this slide might help in showing that it's not quite it's not really blocking the sidewalk or all the way inside where the development is it's kind of you can move around it there's i mean in between the two stones is about almost 16 feet um and also those reflected images might make it feel like it's a bit smaller or tighter but again those are in the ground that you walk on top of so there's quite a bit of space in between them um, let me see if there are any other images. I, mean, I don't know if you can see this so well. I mean, maybe this image might help 
I think it's the reflection. I see your point in that the reflection in the pavers makes it feel like there's very little space in between them. But again, those are inside of the ground. So I can see how the renderings, and you can see again here, they're, they're not directly side by side. There's a, they're kind of staggered a bit to open up the walkway even more. But, but the question is, may I ask, the question, in that image, you have some people sitting on tables, which would, I imagine is the street. Or did I hear earlier that part of the plan is to extend the sidewalk? I, I, help me clarify that. And or is the building kind of obviously reset in from what is the public sidewalk? I mean, I think that's the the confusion about the width of the area there, the sidewalk itself. Mm -hmm. Um, Adam, do you want to ex expand maybe with this? Sure. This explain sure. it. Yeah, I mean, this image and even sure this image and even the one the one prior uh, are both good ones. So, um, you know, the, the the sidewalk itself is being widened to I believe, and I, I don't have it wrapped up my head. I believe it's a 12 foot sidewalk. So the new city standard, they're widened from the original narrow sidewalks when it was Fred Siegel and HD Buttercup along Broadway. Right, um, so they've already been extended. And then beyond that, underneath the buildings that cantilever out from the second floor down, you have you know, these series of angled uh, angled columns that further set back the right of way. But all, all of this space is actually, it's it's on the property, but it's all a public space. So we've, we've decided to help place the piece within that space. You know, we can't put it within the actual public sidewalk, but we felt that um, you know, because you have these areas that are covered uh, and frankly, are also dedicated to uh, you know, future outdoor dining for the commercial tenants um, and potentially other uses um, uh, out in those areas. Um, really, for something of a sense of permanency, we wanted to keep it uh, really in, a, in the you know, most open part we have on the property, which is th that space between those uh, the two towers um, as we have it located. So I, it, it doesn't really give you a, a, a you know, it's, it's a bit challenging. There was one image, um, I think, looking down Fifth Street, although we don't have the the, uh, the rendered people there to show the scale quite as well. Um, that also helps helps show it. Sure. Um, and just for reference, the, the ceilings overhead, those faceted ceilings, uh, that second floor is or really a, a reference to glass. The storefront glass is 16 feet tall. Um, so, you know, to give a sense of scale for the, the piece itself, I mean, the piece is about eight and a half foot halfway up. Those are very high ceilings on that ground floor, which also help those covered areas. It won't feel, feel tight. They'll feel lofty. Yeah, this image looks yeah, that's a, it's good, good. It's the best yeah. feel for me of what it really looks like. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask what the budget is for this? What was the percent for our budget? It, it's a, it was sent to us. In our packets or? Email. Because I didn't see it. In it's 1.2 million. Thank you. Again, that that cost should have been in our packet as well on Thursday. Million. And I remember there was a question earlier that I would like to answer. This is the last slide. Um, so about how the work is anchored. The work will be anchored to the site with an engineered system that will prevent the work from shifting or overturning from potential forces imposed by pedestrians, vehicles, or, you know, any type of earthquake or activity. The anchoring system will be designed by a licensed California structural engineer to make sure that it really is secure for all the elements that can happen. Yes. Um, this is Lori. I mm -hmm. I had a, I had asked the question about uh, preservation, and I noticed that there in the budget there's 3,500 allocated towards a conservation plan, preservation plan. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any more information on that, the, what that plan is, and who's funding it. Sure. Um, I believe if you don't. Mind. 
From what I understand, there's very minimal maintenance, but of course we wanted to work it into the budget. You know, waxing, I believe the surface or sanding every six months or so, that can be done by a local art company or art conservation company. It shouldn't be much, but you know, just to sanding, just to refresh it every so often is essentially all it would need. And then of course we worked in just, I guess, a bit of padding for you know the longevity, however, two times a year for however many years, and in case somebody from the studio needed to come and replace the pigment in one of the cavities. So there's that just that one one time amount of three thousand five hundred for that for the maintenance. Uh, Isabella, this is François Barr. Um, you mentioned that the artist has used that process before in other places. Yes. This, uh, you know, hollow and pigment. And, uh, are there examples that have lasted for a few months or years that we, that you could uh, refer us to or show how it's standing the test of time or getting a sense of, you know, how much maintenance has been required? Yes, um, so this is a fairly, I mean, it, within the past two years, she's made a few works within this series. Um, one was installed in Rome and then installed again in New York for free sculpture in Rockefeller Center. That work was a much smaller boulder and didn't have the reflection, obviously, because it was moved into places. So that would be quite difficult to move. <laughs> Um, but that work traveled very well, had no conservation issues. That work was created about two years ago. Um, another very large boulder about this size, quite similar, was commissioned by a private collector um, and has had no issues. It's really the whole, she worked a very long time to develop this process with the intention of the longevity and it being able to withstand all of the natural occurrences and being able to be in a public place. Um, so we haven't had any issues whatsoever. I'm sorry if I don't have exact, I hope those examples are helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, they're helpful, but they sound like they were uh, relatively gentle use. Uh, you know, the, the thing that gets transported without anything on the ground. Uh, or the things, the, the object that was in a private collection. Uh, this, this will be something that's exposed to, um, you know, skateboards, uh, uh, all, all kinds of, you know, uh, especially the, the part that is on the ground. So, and I'm, I'm just curious about, uh, you know, the process of this, uh, this very slick reflection um, in mm -hmm. color, uh, how that would resist to, you know, all kinds of street um, instruments. So it would resist very well um, because there are the image is made with so many holes and the type of pigment that's injected that's very deep uh, is UV resistant and resin colored. Uh, so the resin is a very resistant type of paint and the UV resistance obviously so the light but when they sand it every six months or so that's just for any kind of wear and tear of skateboards or anything just scratching the surface just to get a little shiny and new. It would be great to see some examples of a place uh, that's been in place for a while and, and see how it survives. Sure. Um, I mean, the Rockefeller Center work was a very small rock and Rockefeller Center is very, <laughs> populated and the work also traveled from Italy to New York and was in Rockefeller Center for about a month or two and there were no issues whatsoever and that was a smaller rock that people could probably climb on and do more things to and there were no issues but I mean I sorry do we yeah. have a picture of that do we have the past work uh did was there a, I think there was a comment from there's a comment from Commissioner Brock, and I think uh, Public Art Committee member Doherty had a question, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, that's correct. Uh, Patricia? Have, 
Do we have a past um, for the integrity and the repairs? Uh, Can you repeat that, Patricia? You very you lucky cut out. to okay. work in Norway. Me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, please repeat the question because we lost it midway. Um, uh, his work on uh, errors. I was just uh, right after it was installed. I wasn't quite at the time, but um, this. Besides the land, the only I comment I got about her work, about her work was about Patricia, you're the, cutting in now, Patricia. The, I'm, I don't know if everybody else is having a hard time uh, hearing you, but we're only getting about a factor. Someone, I'll have to, I'll have to type it up. Uh, past work history of the integrity and repairs of her other pieces that are similar. Yes. Um, Did you hear that? Yes, I heard that last part. Um, yeah, she's made other works in this series and there have been no issues whatsoever with this technique. She developed this technique for a long time. And I just um, pulled up a maintenance document from the studio that I asked them to expand upon the long-term maintenance and why it's so durable, which might be helpful for me to read out. Um, so both of the component, components of the work, the cut stone and the paver, are protected with a nano coating, which is hydrophobic. So water cannot saturate their surface, including the exterior. So it acts as a sacrificial coating to protect the work from graffiti, mechanical abrasion, and can be checked yearly. It can be sprayed with water to eliminate residual buildup and coating can be reapplied as necessary. The coating has an estimated three to five year lifespan before it needs to be reapplied. <clears throat> is that coating work in an area which is uh, by the ocean? Or would yeah. the lifespan be shorter or longer or true to form? It's for any, I mean, it doesn't matter with humidity or rain or, you know, anything coming from the ocean, it's just, the coating just has to be reapplied every three to five years and sprayed down about once a year. And if you would like it to look fresher or there's been a lot of people on it, you can just spray it every six months. Or coat it, you know, earlier than that if something should happen. But it really has an estimated three to five year lifespan in all elements. So is that why the material that the paver is made out of is less important because of this coating? Because we still don't know what the material the pavers are made out of is, correct? Well, I think we were assuming that it was gonna be concrete, um, okay. but I really was, we were putting the studio manager in touch and the artist in touch with the architect and the construction and the project developer, just so they can basically schedule it correctly so that the pavers are put in at the right time. Uh, when they're doing other work there, and also just to make sure that everything looks flush and seamless. So in terms of the history of things, I assume the answer is no, there's no, this is more what you would do, but you haven't had to do it. You haven't had to make any repairs, but you aren't concerned about any, because you have a mitigating process. Is that what I hear? Um, you were cutting out a bit, but I think what you asked was, this is what a long-term maintenance plan would look like, but not necessarily, we, but we haven't had to do anything yet with these kind of works. Is that correct? May I ask a question? Uh, is that Commissioner Baroff? Yeah, yeah. So help me understand, given this is the developer's project, were yeah, is that maintenance or repairs yeah, occurred yes. above and beyond the budget, would the developer just be responsible for fixing it? The, the city is not will not be liable for any um, 
destruction or problems. Even though your budget is what it is now, if if a damage occur, occurs that has to raise your budget, that's something you're going to have to deal. The, the developer will have to deal with. Am I correct right. in assuming that? Uh, and Adam, right. you can confirm that. Can, correct. can I? Can, um, this is Shannon. Naomi, do you want to speak to that or Adam? Sure. Um, hi, this is Na this is Naomi. Um, one of the requirements that the private developer must do um, to finalize their project is to submit a covenant for maintenance that's recorded uh, against the property at the LA County right. level. Um, so there is a, a long-term plan and requirement for them to do whatever it takes to maintain the artwork. Um, so I don't know, Adam can speak to this. The 3,500 is a very small amount in the budget. It might be for the development of that plan. And um, uh, just so people know that the developer would be definitely liable for maintaining the work um, if it ever did come down to it. And I'm certainly not saying that this would happen here, but if the city had to go in and declare it a nuisance or do um, maintenance on its own, um, those costs would be recorded as a, as a lien against the property. Well, we all know that the yeah. city has had, the city has not had great luck at forcing yeah. these development agreements to do what they were supposed to. So I'm, I don't necessarily know if I uh, think that's the way it would go. And I would encourage everybody to uh, think back to some of the other DAs. But I, I think there needs to be more money in the maintenance plan. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just to, to further it, I understand the point about the maintenance plan again. That the, the the thought was that long-term ongoing maintenance wasn't really included in this initial budget. Um, just to further it, you know, we are spending over $1.2 million on the piece to get it installed here. This is not something that um, we would want to look tarnished within month two, six, ten, or even the first ten years, right? This is also, um, you know, somewhat adjacent to the main entrance for the residential portion of the property. It's it's a it's a bit of of uh, uh, of a face of the public area and for it to be defaced or not look the way it, it looks when it was installed day one um, doesn't behoove the building at all from a uh, from any sort of sense of value or wanting to have people live there, et cetera. So just an added note. I, I agree, however, with Chair Myers that, you know, we're good at pre-production and production in the city of Santa Monica. We are absolutely horrible with post-production and to use a movie term. And uh, because of that, you know, I'm always, I'm concerned about something that needs maintenance uh, periodically because we can't see what the economic climate will be later on, especially for apartments right now that are gonna be high priced apartments. So uh, while it may be fine, I'm not sure if something that requires sanding or cleaning other than normal stuff may be a problem three to five years from now. And as someone else mentioned, we're also looking at the potential for graffiti and defacing, et cetera. Um, also, the, the type of coating, the nano coating, it acts also to protect the work from graffiti or any abrasion. Um, and it can just be sprayed with water to eliminate buildup. And the coating can be reapplied if there were graffiti, not necessarily all that it doesn't need to be reapplied. It's just kind of as a safety measure. So it can be reapplied if something were to happen. So this will resist power washing is just is what you're saying also? Exactly. It's uh, hydrophobic. Water doesn't saturate the surface. The work is very, there's very minimal maintenance. Everyone's gone quiet. <laughs> Are there any well, other questions? So, are you done with your? Are you finished with the presentation part? Yes. 
This is the end. Um, I was going to open it up to questions at the end, but I feel like we kind of did that during. So I don't think if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer anything. Or if you would like me to go back to any slides to review again or. I have a question. Sure. Is, does this piece have a name, a title? It's called oh, Split Stone. Oh, I'm sorry, thanks. S simple as that. Split Stone, right. Thank you again. I have a question, please. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm wondering, um, I'm sure the, you know, the public uh, uh, space that has proposed this artwork uh, may have come up with uh, their own set of defining expectations, but what is the, what is the context of this uh, artwork with relevance to, you know, where we are at this point in time and uh, what is the reason that you've chosen this and will there be a, an acceptance of this artwork by a wide and diverse audience? Is that what you? Um, so when the developer of the project first came to me to kind of narrow down and try to figure out which artist might be best for the work for this project, he really emphasized he didn't want a static object that you just look at through glass and only really interact with by looking at it in one way. He wanted something to be very interactive, something that could be experienced by the public and enjoyed by all different types of public, people who might know who Sarah Z is, people who might not, children, just it's interesting from all angles. And he even emphasized, you know, I want the boulder to be interesting from every angle. And this was in the beginning process. So he always emphasized that he wanted something immersive and something that you can experience kind of at all levels or ages and enjoy. And, you know, we really narrowed down Sarah Z because that's something that she's so great at. And if I, one of her previous projects, at the High Line, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a bit back, but she installed a kind of sculptural structure that had a bunch of bird cages and bird feed, feeders attached to the ends, and it looked like it was kind of erupting out of the bushes on the side of the High Line, and birds would come in and, and you know, there would be a bunch of birds around the High Line, and people loved it, and that's kind of what the idea with this work is, is that you almost uncovered this archaeological boulder at this site that feels very natural to, you know, the desert and California and being connected to the natural world and these, you know, the West. And, you know, and then the image itself is reflecting back to where you are a couple blocks away and also in our contemporary culture, what she's very interested in is, you know, the fragility of time. We're marking this stone, which is such a substantial substance, so set uh, with a fleeting image that was caught uh, just one evening. At, and, you know, so that's kind of the idea behind it, is that you're trying to almost imprint a fleeting memory or image into this permanent sculpture or this kind of really permanent structure. I hope that explains it a bit. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay, uh, what's that? I, I just have a quick question about, a little more about the rock. I assume it's going to be cut from a local location, but I'm just curious about the color or the rock, or has there been a decision as to where it might be quarried from? Taken. I believe the, the quarry's in the U.S. And we really want the boulder to feel very natural to its surroundings, you know, feel work alongside the landscaping, the architecture, the color of, you know, whatever they are using on in the surrounding area. So we really want it to look very natural. And the idea was that you kind of came upon this at the site when you're building this development, you kind of came upon this boulder that was originally there hundreds of years ago. So hmm. the boulder will be selected based on that. 
Okay. All right. And so the matter is before the Public Art Committee, and in order to move forward, the Public Art Committee has to send a recommendation or not to the Arts Commission. So would somebody on the PAC like to make some kind of a motion? I would to accept the piece. I've had the piece, but I didn't. Um, so, yes. But Trish, we can't really hear you. It's really hard yes, to hear. Yes, I. Are you making a motion to accept? Yes, I would. Okay, I think we get so. There's a motion from. I make a motion. Not okay, so there's a motion from Public Art Committee member Doherty, seconded by DEPA, uh, to accept the piece per the conditions of the staff report. Well, actually, I think the motion, Michael, is uh, Mike, is that uh, we recommend that the Arts Commission accept it. You rec so you're sending that to the Arts Commission. So, okay, great. Yeah. Do you have that motion, Nathan? I do. Okay, so then I guess just call a roll call on the pack. Uh, just one moment. Thank you. Very good. So the motion is to recommend to the Art Commission to approve the presentation of the Sarah Z artwork for um, the 500 Broadway uh, location. Um, uh, okay. Um, Committee you member have, Doherty. You have committee member Doherty and committee member Depot were yes. the ones that made the motion in the second, Nathan? That's right. So okay. I've got that. Uh, committee member Doherty voting, yes? I know it's hard to hear you, so yes. since you're the mover, I'm going to yes. presume we do have. Committee member Subramanian? Yes. yes. Committee member Vaughn? Committee member Vaughn? Maybe has no okay. longer with us. I think you should unmute. We need to unmute remember? ourselves. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, please, everybody, unmute yourself for this. <laughs> committee member Baroff. Yes. Committee member Barr. Yes. Committee member Pew. No. Committee member Gittleman. Yes. Committee, committee chair Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. The motion passes the recommendation to the commission. Okay, and now the Arts Commission, the matter is before us. We have a Can you talk over me? Somebody say something? A lot of background noise, somebody. Somebody's got some background noise. Okay, we'll try that again. So, Arts Commission, the Public Art Committee has recommended that we accept uh, their recommendation to uh, take the staff report and accept this art project at 500 Broadway. So would somebody like to make a motion? I'll make the motion to accept the Public Art Committee's fair off. Okay, fair off makes a motion. Is it a second? Michael's I'll a second. second. Oh, go ahead. Mr. Michael's is a second. Okay. And can, you any, ask, can you ask the chair to remove the uh, drawing so we can see other commissioners again? Yes, I'm sorry. I will. Even though we can't see everyone. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so there's a motion by Baroff, seconded by Michael, to accept the Public Art Committee's recommendation. Does anybody have any comments or want to make a any well, comments on that before you vote? Commissioner Brock would like to speak. Um, All right. I, I will reiterate the fact that um, I believe that all information has to be in the packets, and there are members of the public online now that I see, and I am concerned that they were not able to view any details of this piece. They weren't able to see the budget of the item as well, and all that had to be put into our packets according to uh, state rule as well as local rule by Thursday. So 
I'm concerned about that. I'm also concerned that we're not, we don't know what the floor surface is. We don't know what the, the artwork is, other than all we've seen is we've got two halves of a rock that may be quarried somewhere in the United States and really not have any relation to Santa Monica. So I will vote no on it, and I have sent a request to the city attorney to review this item for the meeting. All right. I, I, the last sentence is, I absolutely believe that all of our commissions in the city have to adhere to a, a great public process. And and I want to add one last thing, and then I'll be quiet. And this may be the last you have to hear from me on the commission, and you guys can cheer for that. But look at it. It is we want great public art on Fifth Street. I'm not sure this adheres to great public art either. So, uh, you know, wh what's going to stand the test of time that people are going to walk by and stop and look at rather than it just be sort of an impediment as they're walking by in a crowded street or again uh, hit by a scooter? So I'm concerned about that too. But more importantly, I don't believe that this was a legal vote by the Public Art Committee and we shouldn't be hearing it right now. Thank you. All right. And uh, Commissioner okay. Masucci, can I say something? Absolutely, Commissioner Masucci, Vice Chair Masucci. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm definitely moved by what um, Phil is saying. I don't know what the legal reality is, but if what uh, Commissioner Brock is saying um, is in fact accurate, then then I think we we need to realize that whatever motion um, we vote on, uh, you know, may or may not be a valid valid motion. Now, um, I happen to like this kind of art. I, I know that the artist is, um, you know, within the rarefied air of the uh, elite art world, is a star. She's a MacArthur fellow, MacArthur genius, and all that stuff. Um, this will be a feather in the cap of the um, Santa Monica local contemporary art scene. Now, many people feel that aesthetic may or may not be fading. And they, there might be some validity to that reality. Um, but, but the fact is, this is a, um, a thoroughly vetted High concept, internationally um, recognized artist. I, I am going to vote. Did you just <laughs> check? Rose. <laughs> <laughs> We're in suspension. <laughs> oh, no. Waste of time. But um, <laughs> no, can Mike, I we Mike, we missed you at I'm going to vote. You froze after I'm going to vote. Masucci? Of course. I said I'm I'm going to vote yes, but pending the realities that this in fact may be deemed a premature action on our part. That in fact I am moved by Commissioner Brock's um statements that the public should have been privy to at least the budget. As far as the final images, um uh coming towards the end of eight years on this commission, I have uh been asked to vote a number of times on um, concepts and not thoroughly realized work. Um, so I'm not shocked about that, but the question of having received the budget a few hours ago is is a concern that I need for the record to be voiced. Did I say okay. something? Uh, is that Commissioner Yehia? Yes, this is okay. uh, Commissioner Yehia. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with Commissioner Masucci, um, and one way we could handle, and with uh, Commissioner Brock on the budget issue only, um, and we could make the vote contingent on uh, the legal department, uh, the city attorney uh, approving, you know, just confirming that this is legal and if and if it's not then we come back and have another meeting with that and we redo it but i i do i do think that the um you know in terms of the substance of the piece uh i actually think it's a beautiful piece uh i think it does have relevance to our community and so you know i i can't you know i wouldn't uh i wouldn't challenge that at all 
Commissioner Barra? Yeah, Barra? Yeah, may I ask this question? I mean, to what extent, if at all, would the public or even Public Arts Committee or the Commission have any say, so to speak, in the delineation of the budget? Would we have anything to say about changing the budget or or adjusting it? I mean, help us me understand what I, role I, we I, I think it's pretty clear. I mean, it's pretty clear what our role is, and I think it's lined out for you. It says that we have to make sure that they're spending 2% of the overall building budget right. on the project, and if they're not, then they're supposed to put a percent into the percent for art fund. Right. We're also supposed to be able to identify the aesthetics, and we're supposed to be able to identify public access. So the budget, I we, we've been able to see the budget. I think there's a question as to whether or not there's enough money in the budget for maintenance and i i don't i well, don't see go ahead i thought we clarified that the the budget had a line item for a maintenance plan but like the question i asked any required maintenance subsequent to it being installed is going to be the obligation of the developer through some covenant that i heard um we speak of that's going to be dealt with the county. That's above and beyond their presented budget. That's going to be something they're going to have to deal with. So again, my point is, I understand the procedural issue that Commissioner Brock and others have alluded to. My question was basically, is there a practicality having not had that information disclosed in a timely manner, if that is in fact what the issue is? That's all. I mean, I personally believe that I side with Commissioner Brock on this. I mean, getting the budget at 2.30 um, and not having a long time to be able to do what our delegated duties are, which is to really go over the budget and make sure that we understand it. Going over the placement, we still don't know what the materials of the pavers are made out of. It all. I think it's a great piece of art. I think it's an amazing piece of art. I, I think that this presentation left much to be desired, and I think that the public loses when we don't, try to do it correctly. And I think presenting in Zoom, presenting virtually is another technique. And I think that mistakes happen. But I mean, from my presenter view, I didn't get to really see a good piece. I don't think it would have been hard to stick it in the packet, given the fact that we all know that we don't have a big PowerPoint like we used to. Um, so I'm gonna vote no. Mike, can I address the, the issue with the city attorney? You may. Thank you. Um, so Phil, uh, George for forwarded me your email and I basically told him that I'm that we're going to proceed uh, with the vote and then I will, after the fact, he and I can talk about whether it can stand. All so, right. Okay, so do we understand that we go through with the vote, if there's a legal issue with it, then we'll come back and resolve those issues right. and re redo the vote? Yeah, so we don't need to change the motion because the legal issues either will or won't be. So would we, do you guys have any other comments before I do a roll call? I have one other one other question. Do we have- Chairperson have, Myers. Uh, you're cutting out, Patricia. We can't hear you. Uh, Chairperson Myers, I'd like to mention, I had one comment from the public. Sir about maintenance uh, because of its reputation and her ability I recommend the piece the maintenance has to be worked out it has to be public position be reflected because we don't want an eyesore it's it's lovely yes and I think that that person was. I don't see. I don't. I don't see it. I don't see the chat. I'm that looking for it. Person, Mrs. Paula Kate, her, her. Do you want her name? Uh, she. I. I can. I can only make out every fifth word you're saying, she Patricia. For a really long time. No, I. I know it's okay, but I, now we're at the arts <laughs> commission. We're at the arts commission side of the meeting, so we have to finish up that that side of it. Commissioner Baroff. Yeah, just again, a procedural question. Given that this is the middle of August, a um, few of our terms have ended, including yourselves, and that the, the I guess the council may, you know, n appoint new commissioners in September. If the resolution of the legal issue 
that, that's been put out there is not resolved in a timely manner, can we assume that this whole representation will be carried over and next year's appointed commission, um, um, public arts committee and commissioners will then have to retake this whole thing up again? I guess if it was deemed to be an illegal vote, the answer to that would be there would have to be a new presentation with the public getting duly noticed. And the new commissioners that take the places of those of us that are leaving would definitely need to be rebriefed. And so there'd be, it'd have to be a whole new meeting. Any other questions before we vote? I have one other question. Um, did we actually see what percentage of the development budget it was? I, I, we saw the bud, the art budget. We we didn't see what percentage of the. Well, the budget, budget. Says, it says it's twenty nine thousand dollars over what they are required to spend, but we do not have the number of the actual building. That's not in the budget. I don't believe. So the number that we're working. Um, oh no, that's the wrong one. Uh, Naomi, can you explain this? Hi. Yes. Um, so the um, the for the private uh, developer cultural requirement, um, that uh, number is calculated beforehand. So planning um, planning takes care of that, and it's based um, on a two hundred dollars per square foot development cost. So it's it's based on the square footage, um, and that square footage is. Adam, do you have that right in front of you? This stuff should all already right be here. Added. Yeah, it's just over 301,000 square feet. Which translates to the 1.2. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? So we're voting. Roll call. All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Zadikian? Um, yes. Commissioner Yeya? Yes. Commissioner Schwimmer? Have we lost Jeff? Uh, Commissioner Subramanian? Yes. Commissioner Michaels? Yes. Um, Commissioner Jackson, I believe she's left. Mr. Chalice? Commissioner Brock? No. With the risk of being stoned, a resounding no. <laughs> With the boulder. Commissioner Baroff? Yes. yes. <laughs> Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Masucci? Yes. Chair Myers? No. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, All right. Nathan, Nathan uh, Jeff Swimmer just texted that his audio isn't working, but he votes yes. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Uh, we're now on to manager updates, and I am going to dip out. So, Mr. Masucci, it's on you, and uh, good luck to you all. Ciao. Thank before you Thank go, you Mike, guys. Mike, stay on for a second. Thank you for everything. Mike, stay on if you're still there. Listen, guys, if this is in fact the last time we are going to see, um, let's see. Michael, let's there, see. Mike. Michael, let's see if we can get Myers back. Yeah, Myers, come back. Get him well, back. Been, we got to toast this dude. We I'm can't just let him right get sneak out. All right, I'm going to begin my spiel about oh, him. Uh, Mike, he's here or not. Mike, he hold on, and I'm texting okay. him right now. Give us, okay, give sure. us a minute or so. Yeah, All right. we need to get him a plaque. Yeah, look, um, this guy has um, vigorously, tirelessly, pointlessly um, <laughs> rolled the rock up the hill. The boulder. It's a, a boulder with um with a painting of a, a sunset on it. Um, but um, we 
We are definitely, no matter what the future of the Arts Commission is, if there's a future for the Arts Commission, and I know there may be some of the people in this uh, meeting that we won't be seeing again, or, uh, or who knows? Who knows if there'll ever be another Arts Commission meeting? But um, the, the history of the tenure that Myers had cannot go unnoticed. And um, I, I've often felt that um, at the end of something like what he has done, um, he needs more, excuse my language, uh, more than a pat on the behind and a thank you. Um, and, and I think a creative community like an arts commission needs to do more than give a thank you or a piece of paper or something. And we need to think about how the Arts Commission um, goes forward with thanking the unpaid volunteers that do the work that this group does. <laughs> and um, I guess, I don't know if he'll ever hear any of these words. It doesn't matter. He is, he is uh, texting me right now. Okay. Yeah, he is. He. Uh, I'm trying to get him back on. He's uh, a partial quote. He's just really disappointed, and that's yeah. why he's off right then. I know. Uh, I know. And says almost sick to his stomach. Honestly, yeah. I'm, okay. I said Michael is talking about you, and he's saying all bad things. No, right. he says he will watch it when he's in a better place, and he knows okay. when Michael's. Right guy and then it's being broadcast all right um and we love michael we love michael, we chair love michael, 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 michael chair i have known not, yeah, not in almost story. eight years he is the only leadership i have worked under and he is the role model and um whatever goes forward um is going to be difficult to re replace. Um, so with that being said, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing other than um, I guess I just gave the chair report. Are we? Uh, could I just? Yeah, go for it, guys. Yeah, look, as, as long so, as you're in the chair, the rules are a little funky. So Michael, I have a question. Are we presenting uh, Chair Myers with a plaque honoring his uh, dedication to this commission and its volunteerism to the city. I certainly am putting money into that. Um, I think the, the I think normally the city would have already had that ready today, but um, I think if not, then yes, I would. Michael, I'll certainly contribute with you, and I think Lori was about to say she would as well. But absolutely, he deserves, look at he, he, I, I know from my old commission. What and Mary Elizabeth knows from her commission in Burbank what duties the chair has. And Michael, above all else, has always been concerned about art in this city and has taken his responsibility completely seriously. And, and that's an extraordinary function for volunteers. And Michael, you said that commissions may be doomed. I, I will tell you that I and a lot of others working to make sure that this commission and other commissions in our city that, that involve our residents have to be maintained and in many yeah. cases have to be strengthened. Absolutely. To think of a city like Santa Monica, which is a hybrid, which is a hyphenate like all modern cities, a city who believes its art is part of its economic lifeblood. A, a city like Santa Monica that does not give Santa Monica's Art Commission the top status that a commission may have is full of it. And it is time that the Arts Commission grows to the level it deserves to be, and, and it has the blueprint within it, the talent that it pulls together to come to these monthly meetings and contribute its ideas, its work, and its its networks um, is is underappreciated in this city. Uh, underappreciated to the point where that is a flaw, a flaw in the structure. 
And we are in multiple crises. And the arts have always been a part of the solution to crises. The arts have always been an overused word that the arts are not being given essential. The arts are essential. They are our cultural DNA. They are what separates us from the fauna and the plants and the waves and the sunsets and the boulders. They are what make us human. And if Santa Monica has a future, the Arts Commission needs to be a central part of that. And uh, with that, I don't have an agenda in front of me. So if anybody wants to tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. So, so Michael, go. next up is a public art report followed by a manager report. All right. So Naomi's I, next up. I, ju I just wanted to add one more thing about Mike Myers that just to say that he really worked tirelessly uh, for the city and to have the commission's uh, role uh, be carried out in a way that, that people felt heard, all people felt heard. And he put an enormous amount of time into speaking with people and listening to people. And I, I really can't thank him enough. And I, I, I think I'd like to do more than a plaque. I would hope to get a commendation for him also. Um, and when we can all get together again in person someday, I'd, or maybe we can do something, but a, a specific celebration of him and, a, and, a, and, and to be able to express our gratitude because he, he did an amazing job. Gloria and, Mike, Gloria and Mike, if you email me later, we can arrange for accommodations from the state and local authorities as well so that he'll have a, a fitting memento of That'd his service to the he city. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So email me later. All right. Take it away, Laurie. Okay. Well, there is not much for the Public Art Committee to report. We have not had any meetings um, except for this one today that was a joint meeting with the Arts Commission. And so with that, I'll just say I look forward to a time. I don't know when that will be again. Um, as Shannon, I, I assume that the uh, the art, arts and recovery will be will be uh, handled separately. Yes, I'll I'll talk about it in my report. Great. So right. Naomi has a couple updates on what she's been working on with public art. Thanks. Great. Hi everyone. <clears throat> I have four updates, and they're not in any particular order. But um, last Friday we had. The um, one part of Tables of Content in Douglas Park remade the bridge table uh, and placed uh, in a different location, um, according to our discussions with the artist. It's very near to the river that it, or the creek that it used to traverse, but now it's under a tree nearby. The um, contractor is also adding some pieces to the children's slide table. Um, and that should be done, or if it's not done Friday, it should be done this week. Um, and I do have a couple of photos that I can send around of that. Um, for the art bank, our, um, we have two updates. The backstory artwork by Deborah Ashheim at Fire Station One is now totally complete, um, including the framed watercolors that she donated um, to uh, decorate some of the upper rooms and some of the offices at the fire station. So that whole thing is going to be called Backstory and it will be updated um, on our public art archive as such. I'm going to be sending a photographer in at the beginning of September to document. Um, the other art bank update would be that Lives That Bind, the exhibit for the first floor of City Hall East, is set to go up on the 25th of this month, barring any framing delays. Most of the pieces are at the framers right now. And so we hope to receive those on the 24th and begin putting them up on the 25th and then have some pro photography soon afterwards, um, after which they will be featured on Public Art Archive as a virtual exhibit. Um, and uh, the, the last one, but certainly not least, is Belmar History and Art. 
our request for bids to for our general contractor to take on the fabrication and construction and installing of that artwork um, was in progress this last two weeks and today is the deadline for bidders so we hope to have at least a few um, general contractors putting in bids to supervise that project and hopefully we'll get the, the fabrication started soon after um, we are now expecting it to, to take quite a few months longer than we had hoped, most of that due to coronavirus, some supplier delays and such. But um, soon we will have something. Um, <clears throat> also for the Belmar Project, City Council will be discussing the name Belmar Park, which was forwarded to them by the Recreation and Parks Commission. Um, they'll be meeting on August 25th. Uh, wait, is that right? Shannon, you can correct me. I, I think I might have the date wrong, but um, August no, it's 25th. The 25th. Yeah. Okay. Um, to discuss the uh, the name. Um, and those are my updates. Great. Thanks, Naomi. Um, so I'll just uh, go very briefly. Um, the Art of Recovery, which I emailed you about a week or so ago, uh, has re recently launched. We have a subcommittee that's part of the Economic Recovery Task Force. Uh, that has been meeting, and we have um, three Arts Commission representatives on that committee, Michael Masucci, Loriea, and currently Mike Myers. Um, and they've been really instrumental in guiding our efforts and really making this an opportunity to think long-term about how we want the arts to impact Santa Monica and Santa Monica's future, um, and kind of reposition the arts within the city and within our public space. So. Um, it's a very uh, exciting project. Um, we look forward to getting artists to work. Um, I want to share my screen. I'll share with you um, some of uh, the pilots that we did uh, to get ready for the launch of the application. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. Oops. Now we see your screen, your desk. Okay. Nope, not that. Can you see this? Yes. There it is. Yeah. So this is uh, K-Rail on K um, Main Street. Uh, with it, there's The Main Street, if you've been down there, has been lined with uh, these K-Rails to allow for uh, outdoor dining and other outdoor retail uh, during COVID. So we commissioned an artist um, who's on our roster, Molly Ellis, and she did these really fun, whimsical um, hay rail murals. Uh, the process that we used was um, we worked with Main Street and Ocean Park Association, uh, and they selected this artist, and we um, she developed a proposal that they uh, approved, and then um, she went out and made these. Um, and did these over the course of a couple of days. So it's on Main Street and Hill. Um, in M Main Street, we've been working closely with the Business Improvement uh, Association, and they want to really do this up throughout Main Street. And as I'm sure you've seen, Main Street is getting a lot of press right now with um, their alfresco program. Next is the Beach House, which is the, the Annenberg Community Beach House, which is a facility managed by Cultural Affairs and they needed distancing markers at their space. So we commissioned an artist, Urban Rock, to develop these distancing markers that are now up at the, the beach house. So all meant to be very fun. It really, if you've been down there, it does really kind of impact your experience of the space. Um, it's very playful and we see people taking pictures with them um, quite often and um, really just a nice friendly way to encourage people to obey the public uh, public health orders. So those are our pilots. Um, the deadline for the first round is one o'clock, uh, one o'clock, September 1st. Um, I thought I would ask uh, Michael and Lori if you want to um, add anything to, to this. Well, I, I think it's a it's a really visionary uh, project you've got there. Um, I, uh, 
I think the possibilities are are profound, and I think um, in time it's really going to find its legs. Uh, all I would say is that I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm sort of new to the party on how all this works. I've con I've attended the meetings. I haven't really developed anything um, unique to it, but um, I, I'm I'm learning a lot, and I think the the group you've put together is great. So um, that's that's where I'm at. Michael. Yeah, I, I agree, and and I think that the group is is uh, doing a good job of trying to look at at the um, overarching narrative as well as the individual pieces that are done to uh, to have something that really is worthy of of this project. So I think they have high hopes. Well, thanks to both of you for really helping to make this vision help, you know, really, I think that um, your contributions have really strengthened it. So thank you. Um, does thanks, anyone have any questions for me? All right. Well, I think with that, we uh, can we'll adjourn. A, well, before that, um, can I have, like some personal privilege, Ending my term here. I mean, can I speak? I don't know if Lori does too. Well, yeah. I mean, this is I've this this is the end of my you know term, and I after all this, if I, I've enjoyed you know being part of this, and this has been quite the experience, especially. And I you know feel for Mike Myers, especially as he kind of left the way he did, feeling the way he did, all the challenges that one who puts dedicated energy into a effort that sometimes feels a little, I'll be blunt, dysfunctional. Um, and I, you know, enjoyed some of the, you know, functional aspects of this, but I've been mulling around whether to, you know, reapply for another four years. And as I sit here, I'm not, and I'm not looking for encouragement. I mean, but I, because I, I'm really ambivalent, but my inclination is I don't see how this, where we're leaving this commission now, given especially how Mike, left it where this is going i really honor and appreciate the work of the cultural affairs staff you guys are doing a lot of work and my sense is you're doing so much good work that i sometimes question what we're what i what we're doing as a commission to to um support that because you're you're running it on I mean, it's going very well on your own and i think some of the contentiousness that i've experienced this past year or so here this makes me wonder about you know how do we sh how how does one show up a, as a commissioner to do some good work? And I'm you know sitting with it for myself, trying to figure out where do I want to spend my time and how do I want to um, support the arts, which I will always do. And so I just felt the need to say that because you know my turn is my term is also ended as well. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Can you say um, so you have not reapplied? Is that the reality? What because as of today. Uh, next month. Pardon me? So, I've not I mean, I, I, I've tried, I'll be candid. I mean, I drafted out my my application. I've got it there on my computer. And I, I have not submitted it because I literally have been sitting with this and kind of looking toward how these meetings have been going and even feeling what today was like to see where where's the energy, where's the momentum. That's how I operate, my friends, energetically. And I'm just, you know, one, again, for myself, where I'm putting my energy and how my energy is being useful um, to support the good work that the commission is meant to be doing. So that's my, you know, the way I express myself now. So it's a, that's how I'm sitting with this. All, that's all I'm saying. But by thank everyone, it's been a great experience. <laughs> all, all around, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> I take all experiences as, as 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 wonderful engagements in in how we how people work together to try to do something, and we all have different ways of approaching this. So I'm acknowledging that and in, in that obtuse sort of way. <laughs> well, I personally hope you're here next month, but but if not, um, thank you. It's been a it's been a yeah. pleasure, an honor to to work with you. You've uh, you've uh, Raise the ship higher than it than it was. Appreciate that. And I don't know who else is termed out. I don't know what. I'll. I'll I, I don't really need no. to give a speech, but I'll say that 
you know, contrary to what it sometimes seems here, I am a huge supporter of the arts in the city and always have been. And I am concerned as Michael, uh, Michael and Michael are, all <laughs> three, that, that the commission and the arts in Santa Monica remain somewhat hidden. And as you guys know, I am deeply opposed to the arts being hidden in Santa Monica. I want this commission to flourish and I want the arts combined from theater to dance, to fine art, to visual arts, everything to flourish in this city. I, I walk neighborhoods in the city and I've seen far more art on our streets privately than I've ever seen publicly in our city. And I love that, but I'm ashamed that this city, which is composed of artists in so many fields, does not have a true public commitment to the arts. And that is deeply disappointing. So I will tell you whether I'm on this commission or not, I will be striving to put the, art, put the flag of the arts out there as long as I'm alive. And, and I want this commission to do great work and I will support it any way I can because the commissions in this city are the ground root the way for our residents to be involved and help guide the city. And it, not only advisory to the city council, but the arts commission needs to be putting initiatives forward and talking about how to not only save, not only put fingers in the dikes to try and help save the arts, but to try and start new initiatives. Because really, that's the Arts Commission's job, is to point an arrow to things that should be done and to visualize where we want to be. So I wish all of you the best of luck. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And regardless of what happens, um, I think we all know uh, there's no getting rid of Phil Brock in Santa Monica. So um, we we look forward to uh, to working with you in whatever whatever way. I'll only be on this thing for another ten months. I'm not sure what everyone else's uh, uh, clock is, but um, and, and the way it's going, there may not be meetings again for. Till, you know, I'm almost termed out or whatever. And um, so none of us know where it's going. Um, but I think there's one thing that that is clear, that um, a volunteer army of arts advocates is a vital part of any vibrant city. And, and that however volunteerism evolves in this city, even if it's in an I don't know if this is the right way, even if it's privatized, even if, if it's off the book of Santa Monica's uh, City Council, um, we need to um, empower the, the public's voice. We need to, we need to answer the phone, whoever. We need to expand rather than make more elite. And, and we need to include rather then exclude. And um, for me, one of the biggest challenges in the short term uh, because of the crisis is art being reduced to a uh, utility, to something to serve um, a utilitarian function. And the notion that art for art's sake is, is no longer an important thing when for me, art in and of itself has value. Art does not need to be a mechanism for social change to be valuable. It's great when it does, but it doesn't need to be that. It doesn't need to be signage. It doesn't need to be a function of municipal government. It's great that it can do that, but I am very, very concerned that the pure value of art is um, being sidelined in this crisis, and that um, 
art in and of itself is valuable. Art in and of itself is something the city should invest in. Art in and of itself does not need to change the world if it just changes someone's emotions for 10 minutes or an hour or 90 minutes or a day. That in and of is worth every penny in a city that pays far too little for its art. And um, a city that up until this crisis was, from what I could see, incredibly rich, um, pays so little. It is interesting to look at the budget of the proposal we just looked at. That's a real budget. We give people grants for $5,000, $7,000, whatever. That was a budget for over a million dollars. That is what art costs. That is paying people what they deserve to be paid. That is taking the time to do things in best practices and use the resources of all the technologies that exist that, that can function in art making. And um, if the city can't find us money, there are other ways to find money. And we need to start creating art that costs budgets. And um, then this city will be on the map. Um, it prides itself as being an arts capital. But I think those of us that have been privileged to travel know what a fabrication that is. But we can change that. And Mr. Baroff, I respect you greatly. Um, I hope we work together. Um, I don't know how to do the things I'm saying. I don't know how to find us a million dollars for a single piece of art, but I know until we do learn how to do that, um, we are not going to be the art making and art producing and art advocating and art presenting city we claim to be. And with that, I am going to shut up now. And anybody who I had a question, can, uh, raised her hand. Yes. Tell me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can yeah. I just, we're, we're pretty far off the agenda right now, so I think we need to try to, Deepa, if you want to go and then wrap it up. Oh, I was just uh, trying to give my point of view on, uh, you know, in addition to what Mr. Masucci and Barack are saying. So, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know what the immediate foreseeable future of arts, the Arts Commission is, but I think arts, like I said uh, recently, is, is the only uh, field which can make an See, make people perceive things in a way science and data cannot, which we are greatly relying upon these days. Um, data, which is largely inaccurate, and science, which isn't doing much to solve the crisis for us. So I think sidelining art is um, is worrisome, and it's, it's it's only going to make things worse. So I think if we can figure bringing it back into our scheme of things with the least amount of resources, I guess uh, you know that would be a great start. Uh, that's all I, I like to say. I would just like to say if, uh, it was also Lori's last night. So to be fair, I'd like to thank everybody who's given their time and thank you so much for all of that. And think that Lori should have a chance to say some things she would like. Thanks, Mary Elizabeth. Uh, like like Michael Baroff, I um, I haven't uh, decided yet whether to submit resubmit my application either. So we have until September 1st to do that. And I think for me, I, I I'm I've just I don't know what's happening with the Arts Commission, and I think that's in part just this crazy time that we're going through with um, the pandemic. And you know, it just seems like. Um, it's very hard to know whether things are moving in a direction that uh, will continue to be a, a less active commission and public art committee or whether this is just temporary. So it would it would actually be really nice if we could uh, have a conversation about that, but it's not on the agenda. Shannon, can I add one thing? This is one of the best conversations we've had since I've been on the commission. So 
you know, uh, this is something that the commission needs every once in a while is to be able just to talk as humans to other about what they see and what they need in the city. So I really thank everybody who's spoken. And I know that the cultural affairs administrator wants to get off the call, but I honestly, I'm really touched by all of you today. So thank you for your service to the community. Shannon, can I just add one thing? Um, I know we got to go. I, I agree with everyone that we're, you know, we've, we've gone on for too long. But, I mean, to me, one of the most exciting.